Thanks for coming, everybody. Gosh, what a big group we have today. Um, before we get started, one of the things I want to say about the little release thing that you all had to sign. For those of you who have never done a workshop with me before, I do a lot of interactive stuff, and then ideally we'll do one piece of work. If you didn't sign a release and you don't want to participate in that one piece of work, then I totally respect that, and I want to honor that, and please take care of yourself. Um, but I would really encourage you to participate in some of the group activities because it's not like the focus is going to be on you. Um, when we do psychodrama and sociometry, I'm not a big fan of people sitting and watching. So please do yourself the favor because it's also a great way to get to meet people that you might not have already met. So, um, and I know a lot of you, but there's also quite a few I don't. So um, why the inner critic? Why the heck do I, I want to work with this inner critic thing? Um, and I know I'm being videotaped, but I'm going to say this word anyway. Um, years ago, when I got sober uh, in New York, we have always described this as the itty bitty shitty committee that lives in my head. And it talks to me all day long. And um, I don't know how many of you have seen, there's this wonderful campaign on, uh, that Dove products have been doing. Um, it's not playing as much here on the West Coast. It's playing on the East Coast a lot, I hear from my friends. But they have these women write down thoughts in their journal of negative things that they're saying to themselves. And then they hand them in, and then a day or two later, they, have, they hired these actors who will follow them into a coffee shop. And the woman is sitting there and saying, she'll go over to this complete stranger and say, are you sure you want to eat that? You know, your thighs are getting awfully big. You really shouldn't be doing that. And that people sitting around them are horrified, you know? And the woman who is having it said about her starts laughing, but she's blushing as well because she has to admit these are the kinds of things she's been writing down about herself in her own diary. And it's a really interesting exercise to do that, particularly to ask clients to do it. How many times a day do you have a negative thought that you tell yourself? And in, particularly in early sobriety, or even for those of us who have quite a few years, that voice is relentless, and it's mean, and it's hard to shut up. Um, uh, and part of what I want to look at today is not only where does it come from, but what do we do with it? Uh, and because I am a psychodramatist, we use action to deal with it, not just words. Um, so how many of you know the word interject? OK, so most of the therapists in the room. So an interject, it's a, it's a fancy psychological term that basically means a belief or a voice that you have inside of you, as opposed to extra, meaning outside. So in the psychological world, the psychotherapy world, we would say that the inner critic is a negatively interjected voice. It's a voice, as I like to say, I didn't come out of the womb with that voice. Somebody gave it to me, or multiple people gave it to me. Um, Parents, school, church, coaches, Cub Scout or Girl Scout leaders, culture. I mean, for the women in the room, hello, advertising about what we're supposed to look like and what I mean, for the men, too. What kind of job you're supposed to have, what kind of car you're supposed to drive, and if you don't live up to these standards, then there's something wrong with you. Um, Madison Avenue has made a lot of money on that belief system. And they've convinced people, you've got to have this toothpaste, and you've got to drive this car, and you've got to use this hairspray, and you've got to, got to, got to, got to. Um, and it's something that can, that negative interject can absolutely sabotage treatment if we aren't talking about it. So um, what I'm going to invite you all to do, first of all, is to stand up, because that's what we do in psychodrama. And I'm going to invite you to go talk to somebody that you don't know. And here's your topic. Whether you knew or did not know what the topic was today, as you think of the inner critic, what goes on inside? Groups of three are OK. I just want to tease out what are some of the things that came out in that conversation were for, for, from folks? Anybody? Ego. Ego. Say something more about that, please. I didn't see where it came from. <laughs> it's my inner critic. There you go. Uh, yeah, my, my ego wants to. Right, the judgment that comes in. Yep. Yep. Go ahead. Mine would be anxiety for approaching people that I don't know, and I have to do that for a living. So it's a fear that I face on a daily basis. Yeah. Right, right. So that little voice says something like, They're going to judge me. They're not going to want to talk to me. I'm not going to have anything to say. Oh my God, here we go again. It's over. 
Right, and it's really fast, right? Ra for those of you who don't know, rapid talking is a sign of fear, right? Who else? I love it. All the people hiding in the back corner are the ones who were talking. Go ahead. Yeah, and what are some of the messages you're hearing in the middle of the night? Sounds like a roulette wheel. Place your bets, ladies and gentlemen. Where is it going to land? Right. Anybody else? Yeah. Um, it's meant to help me because I don't want to be cut off from other people, so I want to be acceptable. And that voice is helping, but it's so old that it's giving me the wrong information. So what it sounds to me like, and, and my psychodramatist brain is getting very excited because it's like, oh, we need a new job description. We need a new line rather than saying, What's wrong with you? Why aren't you blah, 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 blah? Finding a way to revamp that voice so that it can be more inviting and kind. I remember years ago, I had a wonderful supervisor when I was early on in, in working uh, in the clinical world. And one day, he realized he had more letters behind his name than in his name. <laughs> and there was the ego piece. He, re he started to, to realize that in his mind, he was thinking, if I just have enough credentials, maybe people won't think I'm a fraud. Maybe people will think I know what I'm doing. And so all of us live with this voice on a regular basis. Um, I mean, I, I know a lot of the places where I got this. You know, I come out of having Depression-era parents. Um, you know, the old Irish thing of get yourself a steady job, right? I could, I could go into the brogue if we really wanted to, but um, oh, and I could. Um, <laughs> I grew up with that in my house every day as a kid. Um, but that whole idea of having to be successful, and the, the compare and despair piece comes into play in that as well. That's what you were talking about, Mark. Um, but the, the, in, in the terms of psychodrama, when I think about it in our developmental process, a big piece that happens is we start to develop that inner critic or that sense of shame because we're not getting the balance of the good enough voice. The voice of, you are good enough, you're lovable for who you are. Um, we think you're fabulous. We think you're terrific. We think you can do it. Um, a friend of mine often says that um, her parents brought her up believing that she may not succeed at everything, but as long as she does her best, that's all that matters. And I'm going to cry when I say this, but my father always said that he wanted his tombstone to say he did his best. And he did. When I look back, and believe me, my father's voice is in my head all the time. But I have to look back generationally, because his father's voice was in his head. And my grandfather's father's voice was in his head. It goes on. If you look at the transgenerational trauma that most of us come from, we've been having these messages passed down for decades, for decades and decades and decades. And when families come together, a lot of times it can be a really beautiful experience. Who was it who was talking about the need to have families in treatment? I totally support that 150%. Um, when families come together, you can often get to the root of where those messages have come from. How many of you are familiar with Kristen Neff's self-compassion work? Anybody? Oh my god, you've got to check out Kristen Neff's self-compassion work. Her website is selfcompassion.org. It's extraordinary work, um, and a lot of what she talks about is finding ways to kind of bring in that self-compassionate voice. It's the one most of us don't grow up with. <laughs> quite frankly. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have you stand up again and go talk to somebody else. And I'm going to invite you to share with him or her. And again, small groups are OK. And in the meantime, I'm going to be putting stacks of index cards on the table. I want you to share with somebody what is the message of compassion that you most would like to hear at that moment when your critic comes in and says something nasty to you. So. Who would like to share their message? We'll start with April. Say it again. I am enough. Thank you. Yes, you are. Roz? <laughs> oh, she's telling, she's having a chat with the inner critic. Just let go and love yourself for who you are. Just let go. How about changing that to just let go and love myself for who I am? I want to say a little something about that. I have noticed in our culture, and many of you may have noticed this too, people use the word you instead of using the word I. It's a way that I can separate myself from my feelings. Next time you listen to an interview on television, 
notice it, or even in regular conversation. You know how you feel when you think this. It's about how I feel and about how I think. Um, I think it's a way that people distance themselves from their true feelings. It's just a theory. Um, but a lot of times when I'm working with folks, I and will invite them to use the word I instead of you. Anybody else want to share that? I have grown and arrived. I have grown and arrived, and probably not arrived in the way Bill Wilson talks about it in the big book. It's a different kind of arriving. What was interesting is when you said, don't say you. Yes. I, I looked at my message and I said you. Ah. So that was a big, big There's your aha right there. Yeah. Yeah. Another hand? I saw one. Yes? No? I am successful in many ways and I am safe. That's beautiful. Safety really is key. It really is at the root of all of this. Yeah. I am best, but I am God's mess. Love that. <laughs> I am a mess, but I am God's mess. I love that. Thank you. I'm a big fan of carrying around what I would call a talisman. You know, it's just an object of comfort, whether it's a card that has that message on it. Um, I also have particular talisman in my life. Um, they're small objects, like I have a little glass heart that a dear friend of mine gave me um, that reminds me that I'm loved. Um, so whatever, oh, you have your rock. What does your rock say? Gratitude. Gratitude. Yeah. Yeah, it's a talisman. It really, it's, it's what it is. It's just, talisman just simply means an object of comfort. And so that object of comfort could be the card. There's a, a training group I was a part of for years where at the end of every group, everybody would write a note of gratitude to everybody else in the group. It just could be a couple of sentences. And we would read them out loud to each other, and we would take them with us. And there were times during the year where it was so powerful for me when I was feeling really not so good about myself that I would just pull these little cards out and read them. It would take me all of five minutes, and it could completely shift my mood. Um, I was sharing, I did a presentation last week, and um, one of the women in the group hadn't, she hadn't been practicing for a while. She's been on, staying home with her daughter, and she's now getting back to work. And she said, now that I'm back, I feel like I don't know what the heck I'm doing. I feel like all the time, like I'm sitting in session with people, and I'm like, whoa, why are they coming to me for help? I don't know what the heck I'm doing. And I told her that years ago, I, I was running a a weekly women's trauma recovery group. This was in New York City, and I had a colleague who was doing group on the same night with a, a bunch of women, and we both had very, very challenging clients in our group, and we had a weekly standing phone call. Group ended at 7.30. By 7.35, we were on the phone with each other, and I swear to you, week after week, I'd be like, Marty, I I'm a good therapist, right? <laughs> like, I know what I'm doing, and she'd say, yeah, I I'm good too, right? Because we'd seen each other practicing for years. We both knew we, went, we knew what we were doing, but it was so quick to see how the however came in, how that voice of but or however can, can sneak in so quickly. It's fear. You know, from the positive psychology world, we're finding that the longer we dwell on those negative voices, the more it affects our mood. And, you know, some people say, oh, positive psychology, that's the happiness thing. It's not just about happiness. It's about staying in that positive energy, that I'm enough, I'm a child of God, I'm OK, things are unfolding exactly the way they're supposed to be. It's about staying with those messages. And I know in the recovery world, so often, I mean, I have people who will call me just out of the blue. I had a friend years ago who she must call me three, four times a week and just say, it's going to be OK, right? And all she needed to hear me say was, yes, it's going to be OK. And she'd say, thanks, love you, and hang up. <laughs> I was her talisman, me and about four other people. And it went on for quite a few months, but she was in a really shaky time and she was at high risk for relapse. And that got her through. So it is those relationships in our lives, as Brene Brown would say, the people who have earned the right to hear our stories. It's those positive relationships in our lives that can be those positive interjects. They, they are on the outside and we can find a way to bring them in and make them positive interjects inside. So let me say a little bit more about that. One of the things that I've always had a beef with in the recovery world is this whole idea of, well, you have to love yourself. It's like, well, if nobody ever taught me how to do that, I don't have that capacity to be able to say, well, I'm this and I'm that and I'm lovable and, you know, gosh darn it, people like me. Um, and that to me is where meetings, 
where sponsorship, where being of service, where fellowship, where treatment, uh, group therapy especially, family therapy, individual therapy, it doesn't matter to me. That's where we can start to develop those external positive voices that we can start to integrate. Um, there's a kind of a, a co-regulation that can happen between people. If you believe in me, I mean, I sat months ago with two dear friends of mine uh, from my recovery circle, and I was in a bad space. And the two of them just sat there and said over and over again, we believe in you. We love you, we believe in you, we know you're gonna, you're gonna be okay. And in that moment, I didn't have that belief in myself. And I needed them to hold that space for me. And a couple of days later, I felt better. And since then, they've had those days and I've been able to believe in them. And that's the thing we do for each other in this recover, on this recovery path. Um, and I really would encourage you to support your clients to do the same. Um, I'm a big believer in, you know, I gotta put my mask on first. So if I don't do my own self-care practice, you know, many of you have heard me say this before, my, that same supervisor who had all those letters behind his name used to say therapy's about two people getting better and one of them getting paid for it. <laughs> and I've gotta do my work because if I don't, I'm of no use to anybody else. It's just that simple. And whether that is meetings or yoga or exercise or prayer and meditation, whatever it is, all the tools we know of that we can use. And many of you, I mean, if I ask, there's probably other tools I haven't even thought of. Um, so along those lines, what do I got? About a half hour. Let me have you get up one more time. And this time I'm going to invite you to share with someone. Actually, before we do that, I want you to just take a minute and whether you want to pull out the card or you know the message by heart, I just want to invite you, if you're comfortable, to close your eyes for a minute and just anchor that message into your body somewhere. I like to find a backup generator spot, too, just in case that message can't come forward. So just find a place in your body and let that message of self-compassion land in that place. Thanks for calling, God. Breathe it all the way down into your toes. And let yourself breathe it all the way down into the core of the earth so that you're anchored into that message. Take a couple of deep breaths to really anchor it in. So now, what I'm going to invite you to do, there's three parts to this. There's the inner critic, there's the role of self-compassion, but then there's the part of me that believes the message of the inner critic, right? So one of the ones that comes up for me, I've, in the last year or so, I've been trying to blog more and more, and every time I sit down to blog, my inner critic voice says, oh, please, who do you think you are? Nobody wants to hear what you have to say. Really? Just don't even bother. And then there's this part that believes that voice that says, oh, you're right, I'll just, I just won't, you know, or I've noticed, and I was, I was sharing this with a friend the other day, I noticed that I've started a lot of blogs, but I haven't finished them and published them, right? There's my perfectionism coming in. Because the critic says this, and then there's this kind of despairing part that's just like, I know, I know, I'm, you know, I'm full of it, nobody cares, you're right. Oh, it's almost like it gets me off the hook, too, because then I don't have to finish the blog and I don't have to post it. So think about when your inner critic comes in and gives you that however message, that part of you that believes it. So um, I, I know that um, th there's more people here today than I thought there were gonna be, and I think it would get a little unruly to try to do some sociometry other than what we just did. One of the things on the form for CEUs is about action sociograms, so I wanna quickly demonstrate what the heck that means. Uh, since I promised that people would have an idea of that. So I'm just going to hand pick a few people who I know are friends of mine and who have done this stuff before. So Richie and Ernie and <laughs> Babby, Inger and Gary, come on up. I just want to quickly demonstrate something. Um, Kay, you can come up too. You're my friend. <laughs> okay, so is everybody okay being touched on the yeah. shoulder? Is that all right? So. Um, if you had that negative voice come up in your head, put your hand on the shoulder of the person. Roz, do you want to participate in this too or no? Okay. 
Um, I said your name. I noticed you didn't come up. If you, when you have that, if that voice comes up in your head, put your hand on the shoulder of somebody in this small circle here who you think could help you get out of that place. Who could help you get out of that place if that voice comes up? Put your hand on that person's shoulder. I need a village. I need a village, Richie says. I need a village. Let me ask you to make one choice, Richie. Just for the purposes of demonstrating this, Ernie's choosing you, right? Ernie, you were choosing Richie? OK, so who are you? Make one choice. OK, so can we just turn this whole configuration around? There you go. And you can put a hand there. You're, you were choosing yeah. him, right? OK, but can we turn the whole thing around? That's what I'm saying. So the audience can see you. There you go. <laughs> the best friends. I mean, come on. All right, so Richie, can you, I'm actually going to use the mic for this, if that's OK. This one? Nope. Not that one. Adrian, do you have a mic? You know what, I'll just use this one. So you guys are choosing each other, and you're choosing here. OK, so I'm going to start here, actually. Can you share with Inger directly why you chose her? You can look at her and tell her. Uh, because I would trust her to. I would trust you. Yeah, oh, OK. Because I would trust you to be able to tell you those things that, um, I, you know, that I was concerned about and trust you to. I know that you would make me <laughs> feel better. <laughs> I know that you would make me feel better. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. The, reason I chose, uh, the reason I chose you was the reason that I chose you at the exercise because I knew that you would have some answers for me. Oh, thank you. Nice. And you chose Gary. Can you share with him? Sure. Gary, I chose you because I know that you are caring and you have my best interest at heart always, even though your truth sometimes hurts. <laughs> so are you cheating on me and you have two hands? No. Um, it's a habit. We all know that. We're not going there uh, Yeah. Go um, I, I choose Ernie because I choose you because I do know that Ernie is loving and compassionate and I have had talks with him where I trust with you. with you. I've had talks with you, yes, which I trust his opinion. You trust your opinion? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. And you and Richie chose each other, so share with Richie. Richie, uh, I chose you because I know that you're a, a, a wonderful mentor and that you're very, very compassionate, and I think most importantly, uh, you listen with your heart. And that's exactly why I chose you. <laughs> and Ernie, I chose you because I feel safe with you. And you create a space that is very, very safe. And when we're together and we talk to each other, you are with me. I mean, you're not, you're not working the room. You're with me. And I really love that. Thank you. So the beauty of using exercises like this is that if you have somebody in particular who doesn't realize how much they matter to somebody else, hearing it directly from the person can be extraordinarily powerful. And that's part of what helps plant that positive energy inside of someone. Oh, well, if Richie thinks that way about me, then maybe I'm OK, right? Beautiful. Thank you all for participating in that. So that's an example of what's called an action sociogram. There's like a whole nother couple of three or four days I could do on sociometry that we don't have the time to do. It's a very intimate exercise. It's the, not the first thing that we do when we're working with people, because most folks, especially in early recovery, couldn't tolerate that kind of intimacy. Um, but it's powerful work. And if you want to know more about sociometry or about action sociograms in general, I'm happy to talk to you about it. Uh, so in the time we have left, it's very quick, I'd like to see if anybody would be willing to um, very quickly encounter those three voices, the critic, the one who believes it, and the voice of self-compassion. Would anybody be willing to do that quickly? Come on up. Thank you. You can just 
Tell everybody your name. Claudia. Okay, thanks for volunteering, Claudia. So one at a time, I'm going to have you sit in each of these three chairs, and each one of them is going to represent one of those voices. The critic, the one who believes her or him. My critic has a lot of male energy in it. And then the voice of self-compassion. So which one of those do you want to start with first? The mean critic. Okay, so let's figure out which one of the chairs that is, and you can go sit in that one. Okay? So what is your message to Claudia? Just a sentence or two. What do you say to her? You can't do this. Yeah. Anything else? You're not good enough to do that. Don't even try. Yep. You can't do this. You're not good enough. Don't even try. Okay. Come on back here. And can you choose somebody to take this role? Um, and if you're asked to play a role, you can say no. Okay. So we're just going to hear that message. The mean critic? Yeah. <laughs> just going to hear that. You can't do it. There's no way you can do it. Why even bother trying? Just forget about it. Yep. Okay. So notice what happens in your body. Yeah. What happens? I'm agreeing. I'm agreeing. Yes. yes. You're right. Unfortunately, I believe you. Yeah. So which voice do we want to bring in next? The one who believes her or the one who has self-compassion? Uh, okay. Let's do self-compassion. Okay. Let's find which one of the chairs is that voice in. Okay. So what's your message to her? Yes, you can. Just try. Why can't you? She could do it over there. He could do it. You could do it, too. Okay, great. Come on back to yourself. Choose somebody to take this role. Amber Coleman. Can't miss that self-compassionate voice and that hot pink. It's yeah. perfect. <laughs> Thank you, Amber. Come on, compassion. Come on, compassion. All right. So... You can just repeat that message? Yes, you can. Yes, you can. You can do it. You're great. You're, you're awesome. Okay. So let's hear this third voice, the one who believes her. Right? She's the one who says you can't do it. Oh. You're the one who believes so her. I'm sitting back here. Have now. a seat here. Okay. Yep. So let's hear that message. You can't do it, so don't even bother trying. You're just going to make a fool out of yourself. You'll never be able to do it. Just forget about it. And your message is? Okay. You're right. Yeah, I give. Yeah, you're, you're right. Why did I even think I could? Why did I even think I could? Okay, come on back here and choose somebody to take this third voice. Okay. You don't have to know the person's name. It's okay. And you can choose a man. As my teacher would say, plumbing doesn't matter. Men can play women. Women can play men. Let's get a man up here. Let's get a man up here. <laughs> so you're just going to deliver that message. You're right. Okay. She's right. Yeah, tell her. You're right. What was I thinking? What were you thinking? What was I thinking? Yeah. So we're going to hear all three voices at the same time. Let's just deliver your messages. Don't even bother trying. You can do it. You can do it. You can learn anything. A little louder, folks. Louder. So freeze. Yeah. So what, what's going on? <laughs> just... I, I feel like, ah, leave me alone. Yeah, make the sound. Too much. Yeah, leave me alone. Right. Shut up. Shut up. <laughs> right. How many You're of us right. identify okay. with this inner dialogue? Yeah, we all have it. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to come out here with me for a minute and choose somebody to sit in for you. Who can sit in your spot? No, don't ask. It's your choice. Okay. Oh. <laughs> So once again, we're going to hear all three of these voices at the same time, and we're going to watch from out here. So let yourself say it and be loud. Yeah. Go ahead, all three of you. You can say freeze at any point. You can tell them to shut up. You can do whatever you want. All right, shut up, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> tell them. <laughs> tell them. Shut up. Yeah. <laughs> shut up. <laughs> What do you notice as you look from out here? Well, you in the middle, you were definitely like feeling very, you could tell, anxiety and stressed and... Yep. So what do you it. want to do with this configuration? This is psychodrama. You can do anything you want. You can re-sculpt it. You can bring in more people. You can do whatever. I want to bring in support. Okay, so look support. around and find some support. Okay, do you want to support? 
Okay. And you show her, okay. place her where you want. Um, That's the voice who believes the message of, you can't do this. She's the compassionate voice. Do you want her standing or sitting? Or? Yeah, show her, show her what it looks like. Yeah, just demonstrate it for her. Is that all right, Amber? Sure. OK. Yeah, all right. Other support? And where do you want her? And what do you want her to do with the critic? Shut her up. Uh, yeah, shut her up. Exactly. <laughs> She's doing it. Yeah. Show her. Show yeah. her what you want and so check just, it out with um, Kay and make sure it's okay physically. Well, you, why show her. Put your hand just on show her. her. <laughs> show her what you want. Well, your inner critic's really willing to move easily. Well, mine isn't. Really? She'll go away that quickly? <laughs> Not usually. Not usually. Yeah, that's what I thought. So bring her back here for a second. Have a seat. You may need more than Heather to help you. Okay, I'm to drag the inner critic. You can get some more help. Remember, okay, Babby said you can get help. <laughs> anybody else? It doesn't budge, so. Yeah, anybody else? Maybe one more. Yep, good. She's not going to go very willingly. In the corner. In the corner. Can you be delivering your message? Here right now? Yeah. You're, you're amazing, Claudia. You can do this. You can do anything you put your mind to. You're fantastic. You're smart. You're witty. You're great. And what do you want to do with him? You can't do it. <laughs> Uh, you may need some help for him, too. Get a couple of strong people. Watch out. Uh, you're allowed to ask for more help than just one person. Ah, oh, no, you didn't. Here comes Mark. There you go. Now that's what I'm talking about. Oh! I was getting a little worried there. Yeah. Okay. So, and then uh, I want you two right behind. You, you go ahead and move the chair. You, you tell her what you want her to do and do it. Yeah. I'm compassionate, so I'm. You're going to follow a direction. Yeah, whatever, right? both stand behind. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Both of them you want standing behind? Yeah. Okay, that's fine. It's your psychodrama. You can do whatever you want. Yeah. And just support, almost like you're hugging, but you're not. Can you show them? Show them what you want it to look like. You know, like you're just sort of ramming the people. Okay. So can you do that? Yeah. So come on out here with me for a second and let's take a look. I like that. Yeah. Do you need to do anything else? I like what I see. Yeah. I like, yeah, the critics gone and the support. So I'm going to have you sit in that chair one more time. And you can stand behind, actually, as part of the support. And I'm just going to invite you to close your eyes, if that's OK. Mm -hmm. And can you just deliver your message? Yes. You're amazing, Claudia. You're fantastic. You're smart. You can do it. You can do anything that you put your mind to. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. That's all good. <laughs> anything else you need to say or do before we stop for today? I think that's good. Yeah. That felt good to get rid of the critics. Yeah. So yeah, really feel that in your body. Mm -hmm. Feel the difference. That they're out of your you can't see them. They're kind of that's she's away. They're away. Yeah. So I'm gonna invite you to just Say something from your self-compassionate voice, a message that you're going to carry with you when you leave today. Um, I don't need to listen to those inner critics because they don't know what they're talking about and just ignore them and mm -hmm. I can do it. I can do anything I set my mind to. I can do anything I set my mind to. Nicely done. Thank you. Thank you. So let's de-roll you. Can you just say I'm not your inner critic? 
I believe you can do it too. I'm not your inner critic. I'm not your inner critic. I am Kay. <laughs> I am Kay. Yep, great. <laughs> I'm not the part of you that believes the inner critic. I'm not the part of you that believes the inner critic. And your name is? Alex. Okay, and? I'm not your self-compassion. I'm not your self-compassion. You are? Amber. Yep, and I'm not you. I'm not you. I'm Lynn. Okay, great. Let's give them a round of applause. Have a seat. Thanks for all those helpers. Um, so I'm going to invite you, and I do mean this, like a minute and a half. Turn to somebody sitting next to you and just share for a minute or so about anything that might have come up for you watching that. Go. You can stay right in your seats. So... One of the things I love about psychodrama is that trying to talk our way out of this voice is not particularly effective. But I would imagine most of you in this room had a visceral response to that voice being moved over here, the other voice being moved over here, and then that image of support. Um, I don't know if anybody who played a role wanted to comment on anything that happened or anything. No? Yes? Thank you for the opportunity to grow. You're welcome. My pleasure. Yeah, and we can get really playful with it too, right? I was expecting the guys to like go do a dump truck into the, the dump, oh, right? That, that did I was evicted by yeah? <laughs> they literally dumped you off. I may hire those two guys when I'm in a difficult place. You can add that one to your business card, guys. Professional inner critic dumper. Um, so, uh, any other questions or comments anybody wants to make? If anybody wants to know anything else, about, well, there's a lot more to know about psychodrama, but um, just to say a little bit about, I do run training groups here in Orange County. I have two of them. I have one down in San Diego. I travel all over doing workshops and trainings. I also do workshops for personal growth for some of the clients that you guys work with. Folks who have a little bit of recovery under their belt, not people who have 20 minutes because they usually can't tolerate that kind of depth. Um, so I have flyers over on the table. I'm also doing a Daring Way in Action workshop with a colleague of mine in just a couple weeks here in Orange County. If anybody wants any more information, I'm happy to share anything with you about that. Mm -hmm.